Hi everyone, I'm Trish and I'll be reading from God's alive and active word today from Jeremiah 1. So please join me. The words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, one of the priests at Anathoth in the territory of Benjamin. The word of the Lord came to him in the 13th year of the reign of Josiah, son of Amon, king of Judah, and through the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, down to the fifth month of the 11th year of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah, when the people of Jerusalem went into exile. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send to you and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I point to you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you see, Jeremiah? I see the branch of an almond tree, I replied. The Lord said to me, you have seen correctly, for I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. The word of the Lord came to me again. What do you see? I see a pot that is boiling, I answered. It is tilting towards us from the north. The Lord said to me, from the north, disaster will be poured out on all who live in the land. I am about to summon all the peoples of the northern kingdoms, declares the Lord. Their kings will come and set up their thrones in the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem. They will come against all her surrounding laws and against all the towns of Judah. I will pronounce my judgments on my people because of their wickedness in forsaking me, in burning incense to other gods and in worshipping what their hands have made. Get yourself ready. Stand up and say to them whatever I command you. Do not be terrified by them or I will terrify you before them. Today I have made you a fortified city, an iron pillar, and a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but will not overcome you, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Thanks, Trish. Just before I start, I want to say thank you to those of you who have been praying for my health for the six months that I was away. I was aware of your prayers and really encouraged by them and so thankful that God answered them and to be able to be back here again. So Michelangelo, the Renaissance artist, painted seven Old Testament prophets on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel and this is his Jeremiah. Have a look at it. What do you notice? What mood does it evoke? Michelangelo has painted Jeremiah. It seems at the end of his life, he's an old man. How, according to Michelangelo, have the years treated Jeremiah? Well, the rabbis called Jeremiah the weeping prophet. But it seems at this point he's all cried out. He sits there hunched, his head bowed. His face turned to one side, his eyes cast down. He looks like a man who through the years has become accustomed to being knocked and battered and bruised. Jeremiah, why so glum? Well, the opening verses of the book give us a clue. Because they explain when Jeremiah served as God's prophet. When was that exactly? Well, it was from verse 2, it was from the reign of Josiah through until verse 3, the time of Zedekiah. And here's the really important bit at the end of the verse, when the people of Jerusalem went into exile. 
You see, Jeremiah was God's prophet during a time of crisis, spiritual crisis. Reading those opening three verses is a bit like reading a doctor's bio that says, Dr. X was the government's chief medical officer from 2019 to 2022. See, what a gig would that be? Chief Medical Officer during that horrible time of a global health crisis. Well, Jeremiah is the Chief Spiritual Officer during a spiritual crisis. The exile. The fall of Jerusalem. The apparent end to all the hopes of the people of Israel. Now, the bulk of our text today, verses 4 through to verses 19, the bulk of this text is an account of Jeremiah being called to that very difficult task. And so we're going to examine this calling text now and we'll begin by noticing just how difficult and dangerous Jeremiah's task is going to be. And then we're going to explore how God empowers Jeremiah to do it. So it's a difficult and dangerous task made possible by God's empowering. Let's begin with the difficulty and the danger of the task. In verse 4, God's word comes to the young Jeremiah, declaring, verse 5, that he has appointed Jeremiah as a prophet to the nations. Verse 6, Jeremiah is overwhelmed. Alas, sovereign Lord, I don't know how to speak. I'm too young. God's prophet, God's messenger, me to the nations? I'm no public speaker. I'm just a boy. Why me? How could I possibly do that? See, Jeremiah immediately grasps just how difficult and just how dangerous this task is going to be. When a humble, unimpressive little hobbit named Frodo is chosen to make a difficult and dangerous quest to destroy the one ring of power, this is what he says. I'm not made for perilous quests. I wish I'd never seen the ring. Why did it come to me? Why was I chosen? Jeremiah's response is a bit like that, isn't it? Why me? Oh, please, please someone else. And I think it's a pretty normal human response to being called to something which is difficult and dangerous. Then in verse 10, God outlines Jeremiah's task. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. There's that key verse that Jansen talked about before. This is Jeremiah's job description, summarised in six verbs. Four of them verbs of destruction and then two verbs of renewal. And as Jansen alluded to before, this 4-2 ratio anticipates what's to come because Jeremiah is going to spend most of his time in this book delivering messages of judgment, rebuking sin, exposing injustice, denouncing leaders, announcing destruction. Yes, there will be precious messages of hope, of a subsequent rebuilding, but most of Jeremiah's job will be a ministry of tearing down. Who'd want a job like that? Imagine for a moment that you are in Jeremiah's position, receiving this Verse 10, job description from God. See, if I imagine me in his shoes, I imagine myself saying things like, well, how about if I just focus my messages on those last two verbs, the building and the planting bit? And while we're negotiating, God, of all the nations and kingdoms that you're appointing me over, how about if I start with the smaller and weaker ones? What about you? How would you respond to that verse 10 commissioning? Because God is not giving Jeremiah any wiggle room. Back in verse 7, he's already said, you must go to everyone I send you and say whatever I command you. If God says, tell the high priest that he's a sinner, Jeremiah has to do it. 
If God says, tell the king that he's forsaken me, Jeremiah has to do it. If God says, tell the whole nation that Jerusalem will fall, Jeremiah has to do it. No matter how unpopular the message, no matter how powerful the recipients. What a job. What a difficult and dangerous job. And what exactly is this message that Jeremiah is going to have to deliver? Verse 13. The word of the Lord came to me again. What do you see? I see a pot that is boiling, I answered. It's tilting towards us from the north. The Lord said to me, from the north, disaster will be poured out on all who live in the land. I'm about to summon all the peoples of the northern kingdoms, declares the Lord. So this this bubbling, boiling pot, which is spilling its dangerous, scalding liquid from the direction of the north, is a picture of a ferocious nation coming from the north to destroy Judah. And it's going to be a total humiliation. Verse 15, their kings will come and set up their thrones in the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem. That's something that ancient kings sometimes did when they defeated an enemy and wanted to show their complete domination. They set up their throne in the gates of the vanquished capital. It was a, it was a non-verbal, well, look who's in charge now. And this is the unpopular message that Jeremiah is being commissioned to deliver. It's a humiliating nightmare scenario for the people of Judah. And not only that, but Jeremiah's task is to lay the blame for it all on the people he's delivering the message to. Verse 16, all this will happen because of the people's wickedness in forsaking God and worshipping other gods. So just to summarise, the message Jeremiah needs to deliver to the people is an invasion is coming, you'll be defeated and humiliated and it will all be your fault. What a job. What a difficult and dangerous job. And just in case Jeremiah had any faint hope left that the people were going to receive this message well, God says in verse 19, they will fight against you. These people I'm sending you to preach to, these kings and priests and leaders and people in power, yeah, they're not going to like what you have to say to them. They're going to oppose you. They're going to fight against you. See, it's no wonder that Jeremiah is reluctant, isn't it? He was reluctant back in verse 6 before he heard all the details of what he was going to have to say. And indeed, if we read on through the rest of the book, we see that Jeremiah's job turns out to be every bit as difficult and dangerous as we anticipate here in chapter 1. Just a few highlights, if you want to call them that. In chapter 20, he's going to be whipped and put in the stocks. In chapter 26, he's going to be attacked by a mob. In chapter 28, ridiculed by a false prophet. In chapter 36, he's going to be threatened by the king. And then in 37, arrested, beaten, accused of treason, thrown in jail. In chapter 38, thrown into a deep, empty well. And he's going to go through all of this alone Since in chapter 11, his family are going to turn against him and plot to kill him. And then in chapter 16, God is going to forbid him from marrying. See, this task that Jeremiah is being called to here in chapter 1, it does indeed turn out to be for him a difficult and dangerous task. And yet he does it. Jeremiah does what God commissions him to do. We know that from the opening three verses. If we read those verses two and three and work out the kings that he served under, he's doing this for 40 years, more than 40 years, from Josiah till the exile. How? How does Jeremiah do this? 40 years of suffering and opposition 
of battering and bruising, 40 years of difficulty and danger, mockings and threats, stocks and empty wells. How on earth does Jeremiah do it? Earlier when we met Michelangelo's Jeremiah as an old man, our question was, Jeremiah, why so glum? Or maybe a better question would be, Jeremiah, why still going? How have you done it after all these years? In the years after COVID, there was what some described as a burnout epidemic amongst political leaders. Don't know if you followed this, but all around the world, including here in Australia and nearby in New Zealand, leaders who had such a difficult task of leading through that crisis resigned, saying, I'm burned out, I'm exhausted, I've got nothing left in the tank. And as challenging as being a leader through the pandemic would have been, and I'm sure it would have been tough, the crisis in Judah in Jeremiah's time was an even greater one. And Jeremiah's task, you'd have to say, after all we've just seen, was even more difficult, even more dangerous. And yet he kept going for 40 years. How? Embedded in this call account here in chapter 1 is an answer to that how question. And I want to say that the answer to that question is so important for every one of us. Because even though our role is not identical to Jeremiah's, we're not Old Testament prophets, we haven't been commissioned to announce an invasion, even though our role's not identical, there are important parallels. You see, like Jeremiah, we too are called to be God's messengers. Like Jeremiah, the message that we proclaim has both warning of judgment, the tearing down part, as well as hope of salvation, the building up part. And like Jeremiah, we live in a world today where people have rejected God and are embracing sin and rebellion. And so we too expect opposition as we deliver the gospel message. So the answer to how Jeremiah was able to persevere is precious to us. Because as we learn how he was able to persevere, we ourselves are being equipped to persevere in the task that God gives us to be messengers of the gospel. So how could Jeremiah do it? How could he persevere in the difficult and dangerous task that God gave him? Well, the answer in short is that he couldn't. By himself, he couldn't. Not a chance. But God working in him could. For Jeremiah, by himself, it was impossible. But for Jeremiah, empowered by God, enabled by God, it became possible. See, embedded in God's call of Jeremiah here in chapter 1 is an incredible, rich, wonderful picture of how God empowers his messengers, all of his messengers, including you and me how he empowers us to carry out the tasks that he commissions us to do. And we're going to see in this chapter now that God makes four assurances, four promises that point to this amazing empowering. Let's look at these four promises, these four assurances now. Number one, I made you for this. I made you for this. Have a look at verse 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as prophet to the nations. Before Jeremiah shed his very first tear, before he drew his first breath, before he was even conceived, God knew him. That word for know is the the knowing of personal, deep, intimate relationship. Before Jeremiah even existed, God knew him and set him apart for the task and appointed him as God's messenger. That's mind-blowing, isn't it? When in the future this task that Jeremiah is being given here is going to get tough, when he gets put in the stocks, thrown in a well, when he feels such despair that he's going to curse the very day of his birth, this 
is the powerfully sustaining truth that he will be able to draw on. That long before the day of his birth that he now wants to curse, God knew him and God set him aside for this very task. He was made for this task. And what was true for Jeremiah then is true for us new covenant believers now too. Have a listen to what Jesus says in John 15, verse 16, to his followers. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. Paul in Ephesians 1 said that God chose Christians before the creation of the world. And then in Ephesians 2, that we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Brothers and sisters, when you find the gospel ministry task to be difficult and dangerous, and you will, hold on to this. It's what you were meant to do. It's what your creator created you to do. When I was a kid, my dream was to play cricket for Australia, to wear the baggy green. I've even brought a prop to show you. This was my dream. Every afternoon I would be in the backyard with a cricket bat in my hand, hand throwing a ball against the wall uh, and, and just, just hitting fours. David Boone would be batting at the other end and when he got out, Alan Border would come and join me and we would have another great brothers and border partnership. And that's what happened every afternoon and I dreamed of playing cricket for Australia. Well, many years later, decades later, when I found myself serving as a cross-cultural missionary in Southeast Asia, I realised something. This particular day, I was driving in a car uh, on the way to the Bible college where I taught. I was driving along this windy road through these little Muslim villages filled with unreached people, and I was thinking about the material in the, in the Bible class, I was about to teach to this precious group of local believers who had been trained to go out to take the gospel over this gospel-poor country. And I realised something. And I even said it out loud. I said, this is better than wearing the baggy green. This is better than batting with Alan Border. Not because it's easy. It was often very difficult. Not because it was safe. If you've ever seen the traffic in the city where I lived, it was dangerous just getting to Bible college each day. What lay behind that realisation that day was I was doing what I was made to do. What my creator who intimately knew me before I was even conceived, what he created me to do. And that experience is exhilarating. Even when the work is difficult and dangerous, it's exhilarating. And so that's the truth that we need to draw on, the truth that will sustain us when things get difficult, when things get dangerous. God's empowering assurance, I made you for this. So that's the first one, the first of the four assurances. The second one. I am with you. Verse 8, God says to Jeremiah, Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you. Now remember the context. Jeremiah has just said in verse 6, I can't do it, Lord, not me. I'm no public speaker. I'm, I'm young. I'm inexperienced. And notice when God responds to him here in verse 8, he doesn't actually correct Jeremiah. He doesn't say, oh, no, 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 Jeremiah, don't be too hard on yourself. You're actually quite a good orator and you're not that young. What Jeremiah is saying here might well be true, but that's not the point. Because God will be with him. And so what would otherwise be impossible is possible. This I am with you assurance is so fundamental that God repeats it at the end of the, end of the passage in verse 19. They will fight against you, that is the kings, the officials, the priests. They will fight against you, but 
will not overcome you, for I am with you and will rescue you. There will be times in the future when Jeremiah will have deep, profound doubts. What will get him through? There will be times when he's almost breaking under the pressure of opposition and threats and mocking. What will get him through? There will be times when he's put in the stocks and thrown into a well. What will get him through? What will get him through is that God will be there with him when he doubts, when he's threatened, in the stocks, in that deep, dark well. God will be there in that well with him. This promise that God makes to Jeremiah here, it's the same promise that he makes to Moses as he sends Moses into a difficult and dangerous battle. It's the same promise he makes to Joshua when he sends Joshua into a difficult and dangerous battle. It's the same promise he makes to us as he sends us into our difficult and dangerous battle, our great commission. Go, make disciples of all nations, and surely I am with you always to the very ends of the age. If I think about the, the peers that I train for in ministry here at, here at college, and then I think about the people that I've served with in ministry in different places around the world, I can think of plenty of examples of difficulty and of danger. I can think of people who've been threatened and shunned, people who've been mocked and laughed at, people who've been betrayed and hurt sometimes even by their own congregations. I can think of people who've been called before the police in countries where gospel work is illegal. There's no reason to expect that your experience will be any different. When those dark hours come, when it gets difficult, when it gets dangerous, what will get you through? He will. Because he will be right there right there where you are with you. Four empowering assurances. The first one, I made you for this. The second one, I am with you. Now the third one, I am watching. It's common all around the world for local communities to identify a particular flower which, when it buds, it means that the new season is on its way. Usually spring, spring is on its way. Here at SNBC, of course, we've contextualised that a little bit. So we have a tree that tells us when exams are about to come. This is your first year here. Watch out for the jacaranda tree. Well, in Jeremiah's hometown, it was the almond blossom that would herald that spring was on its way. The Hebrew word for almond, shaked, sounded like the word for watching, shoked. So the almond tree was the watching tree. It was watching to tell you that spring was on its way. Now, God uses that little word play here for his next empowering assurance. Verse 11, the word of the Lord came to me. What do you see, Jeremiah? I see the branch of an almond tree, I replied. The Lord said to me, you've seen correctly, for I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled so the almond tree, the watching tree, is for Jeremiah a picture of the fact that God is watching. And it doesn't just mean he's watching passively the way we might show, watch a show on Netflix. He's watching to make sure that his word is fulfilled. That's what God does when his messengers speak his word. He watches to see that his word is fulfilled, to make sure that everything that he's promised and is saying through us comes to pass. So there will be times for us as God's messengers where being God's messenger becomes difficult or even dangerous. Maybe it's difficult because we're not seeing any response. Perhaps we're getting rejection, getting opposition. We might be tempted to think that what we're doing is pointless. We might be tempted to give up. At those moments, remember the almond tree, the watching tree. 
Or maybe even when you're just eating your muesli in the morning and you see a sliver of almond, let that be a reminder to you that God is watching to see that his word is fulfilled. It's never pointless when we speak God's word. He's watching to see that it achieves the purpose for which he sent it. God's four empowering assurances. I made you for this. I am with you. I am watching. And now finally, I will make you strong. In verse 18, God says to Jeremiah, I have made you a fortified city, an iron pillar, and a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. Jeremiah is going to do battle with the whole land, and God is not going to protect him from that, from the dangers of that. But what God will do is he will make him strong for it. That's what he promises Jeremiah here, and it's what he continues to do for you and I today. Have a listen to how the Apostle Paul reflected on this same process in the New Covenant era after Paul had a difficult and dangerous gospel ministry experience. Reading from 2 Timothy. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. That's what God does. He gives strength to his messengers. He makes us strong for the battle that he has sent us into. There's an old adage for parents. Prepare your child for the path not the path for your child. There are hard things out there which our kids are going to have to face one day. Conflict, struggle, injustice, hurt. This adage is saying that what a good parent does is realise that the children need to face, need to develop the strength to face those challenges. And so what we need to do as parents is to prepare the children for that challenging path, that difficult path. If we do the opposite, if we, if we make the path empty, if we clear it of all the obstacles, if we helicopter in to rescue from them from trouble, if we shield them from any struggles, if we're artificially making the path clean for them, they won't learn to overcome hardship. They won't learn resilience. They won't learn how to become strong. If you are a gospel messenger, there is a difficult and dangerous path out there for you to tread. And God is not going to clear it for you. God is not a helicopter parent. He doesn't save us from difficulty and danger. No, he sends us into it. But with the promise that he'll make us strong to face it. A fortified city strong. An iron pillar. A bronze wall strong. He made Jeremiah strong to face the challenges on his path and he will make us strong for the challenges of our paths too. I remember the first time I got up to teach a class in the Bible college I was teaching at in Southeast Asia. I remember looking down at the notes, the freshly made notes in a language that a year earlier I hadn't spoken. And that day I remember feeling what I imagine similar to the way Jeremiah seems to have been feeling in chapter 1, verse 6. Alas, I can't. I don't know how. I'm out of my depth. I remember the first time I tried to share the gospel with one of my Muslim neighbours. Same feeling. I remember a time not long after that when I was at a Muslim funeral and the the MC threw to me to lead everyone in prayer. (laughs) This is an exciting opportunity, but I had the same feeling. I can't, I don't know what to say, I'm out of my depth. I remember returning to Australia and starting my new role here at SNBC and immediately facing complex, difficult decisions. Again, same feeling. I'm out of my depth here, God, I don't know how. How about you? 
Have you felt like that? Have you found yourself saying, I can't do that gospel ministry task. I'm not wise enough. I'm not old enough. I'm not brave enough. I'm not strong enough. Our text today frees us from a fear that paralyzes with a message that God empowers us to do the difficult and the dangerous and that he empowers us to persevere in it for a lifetime. And so when we feel inadequate, when we feel out of our depth, when it is hard, let's remember how God empowered Jeremiah. And let's remember that the same God empowers us. He made us for this. He's with us. He's watching. He is making us strong. Are you daunted by difficult and dangerous gospel ministry tasks? When we, like Jeremiah, step out in obedience, we will see that what is impossible becomes possible by God's empowering.